I am blessed to be able to welcome Stellark and Nina Sellers here to uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum for a very special Virtual Futures Salon. Now, this event forms part of the VNA's Digital Design Weekend, <coughs> organized to coincide with the London Design Festival. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of something we call Virtual Futures. So for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid 90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the uh, silicon, the jargon, the charismatic prophets and the designer drugs, as well as the techno parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. For many in this audience, the individuals sitting beside me really need no introduction. Their work is characterized by their unique interrogations of, and often with, the human body. These artists provide us with the uh, performative promises of a post-human future and have defined the aesthetics through which we begin to understand these trajectories. Now, Stellark is a performance artist who has visually probed and acoustically amplified his body. He's performed with a third hand, a stomach sculpture, an exoskeleton, a six-legged walking robot, to name just a few of his works. And he's currently uh, the Distinguished Research Fellow at the School of Design and Art at Curtin University. And Ina Sellers is an artist whose practice focuses on the way anatomy has shaped our understanding of the body. This interest has taken her from working uh, in art studios and wet anatomy labs to working in physics labs and medical uh, imaging facilities. And currently, Nina is the uh, artist in residence at Symbiotica, uh, a biological arts laboratory at the University of Western Australia. Now, collectively, their work forces us to question the ways in which bodies are understood and treated, how they are recognized and uh, are cognizing. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Stellark and Nina Sellers to Virtual Future. <laughs> now, Nina, I want to start with you because your artistic practice begins uh, in part in the anatomy lab and with body dissection for the purpose of medical display, is that right? Well, I, I was working at an art school and then my artwork was seen and they thought I'd be very appropriate to be working in an anatomy lab. So yeah, I, I sort of worked in an anatomy lab, not only as an anatomical illustrator, but also as a body dissector. So, <laughs> so it's a very nice first welcoming image to the, to the, to the lecture, but... Um, so yeah, so I was working with bodies as well as illustrating. So how did the, the process go between uh, this practice to sort of some of the work that you're working on now? So where is the similarity between, say, uh, the work you were doing in a medical context and the, art, the work you're now doing in an arts context? I think the, the employment aspect of my work sort of underpins sort of uh, a lot of the theories that I look at. So I'm very interested in the way that anatomical knowledge is enacted and conveyed. So actually participating in those actions uh, gives you insight rather than, you know, looking on from a, as a sort of outsider. Um, and I, I guess I critique, a lot of my modern work now is critiquing the practices of anatomy. Like ideas with post-humanism, if you're going to extend the body, what ideas are we taking from what is basically a 16th century way of understanding the body? And are we just amplifying and, and carrying on a tradition, not actually exploring the assumptions that we have in those traditions? Now, th this work here, if you could explain a little bit about what's going on here. <laughs> okay, so this is um, jumping far ahead into like new media sort of work. So 
I'll also add I don't really have a hierarchy in the way that I work. So I still do a lot of classical work plus work with new media. So this work was um, looking at the way that anatomical knowledge is conveyed uh, and, and also how it exits the sort of medical context and enters into more social realms. So in a way, anatomical images now have a social life. They sort of escape and exceed our sort of expectations within the limits of medicine. And this work, um, you could enter into the gallery space and with your phone scan the QR code and it enabled each viewer to, to leave the gallery space with a little brain playing in the palm of their hand. So it was a poetic work, but I could also track online where it was being activated and how many times. So for a shy person, which I, which I am socially, <laughs> it was kind of sweet to see how much my brain was getting out and about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Nina, you, you kindly shared this image with us, which you feel demonstrates some of the practice that you're working on right now. Okay, so this might seem very abstracted from notions of anatomy, but I came very interested in how anatomy is visualized. And so I was looking at cellular sort of images. And you've got to remember that anatomy is a science that's predominantly based on visual observation. So it's uniquely reliant on images for the, for the sort of dissemination of that knowledge. So I was looking at how we engage with, with images of anatomy. And in the 21st century, we seem quite preoccupied with um, translucency and volumes without mass. And I was trying to find the point that we started to really engage with that. And that was with cytology and microscopy and the study of cells. So this work was, um, it just made images. It was a combination of light and glass. Uh, two very simple little physical components that existed in the gallery, but it made these huge volumetric sort of images that people can, could engage with and sort of almost question imaging and our engagement with imaging and where and how sort of uh, images are made and how, how we sort of, the effect that we get from them. Now, Stellark, your practice uh, is, comes from a slightly different place than uh, Nina. Your work incorporates prosthetics, robotics, biotechnology, I mean, how do all these things play together? Um, yeah, I guess having done a series of sensory deprivation and physically difficult performances uh, and the suspension works, um, there was a kind of a desire that was generated after doing these projects um, uh, to do with augmenting the body. So you, you sort of, in a sense, exposed uh, the inadequacy and profoundly obsolete uh, physiological structure of the body. And the idea was, well, if you could sort of adjust the architecture of the body, uh, you might also be able to kind of generate new kinds of awarenesses of the world. I mean, we operate and become in the, aware in the world uh, because of our physiological kind of apparatus, uh, our, our perception, our, our mobility, our, our cog cognitive capabilities. Um, so the third hand was the first uh, attempt to augment the body. Uh, and uh, this was a, a project where um, the third hand was uh, seen not as a, a prosthesis uh, that was a sign of lack, but rather a prosthesis as a symptom of excess. So technology added to the body. Uh, the body doesn't need this technology. It's not uh, an action of necessity. It's an act of contingency. It's an aesthetic uh, gesture. Um, and uh, you actuated the third hand uh, using uh, uh, muscle signals. Uh, so it was a very intimate interface. So by controlling abdominal and leg muscles, you could generate uh, different kinds of um, actions and in this project it just illustrates that you're writing one word each hand is writing a separate letter uh, at the same time you have to keep your two eyes on what your three hands are doing uh, and because this performance occurred on a sheet of glass between the artist and the audience I had to learn to write the word back to front uh, remembering that I was writing every third letter <laughs> so, it, you know, it wasn't, wasn't an easy um, pro process and I only learnt to write two words, evolution and decadence. Uh, these, were both, <laughs> these were both nine letter words. 
And then you move to these more these exoskeletal works as well. Is, is a large part of your practice. Yeah, uh, the third hand. Uh, there was an extended arm, a, a virtual arm, like Nina. I, I, I've been oscillating between uh, uh, focusing on biological, technological, and sort of virtual concerns. Um, here was a performance done earlier this year titled. Uh, stick man. It's a full body exoskeleton. Um, and uh, so the body was algorithmically driven. Uh, this was a five hour performance in which uh, you, you just didn't know what uh, set of gestures the, the algorithm was next going to choose. Uh, so effectively you were performing involuntarily. We're now designing a, a haptic interface, uh, a sort of a mini stick man where you can walk up to it, press play, move the limbs, um, I mean, press record, move the limbs, then press play, and the exoskeleton activates and your body is animated. Uh, so that's a full body exoskeleton titled Stick Man. And then the most recent uh, uh, performance is um, one titled Rewired Remixed. It was first performed uh, actually in Perth last year where we connected Perth, uh, London, and New York. And for five days, uh, six hours a day, continuously, I could only see with the eyes of someone in London, that was Robert, uh, Luke Robert Mason. I could only hear with the ears of someone in New York, uh, Lauren Rosa, uh, whilst anyone anywhere could access my right arm via the exoskeleton and remotely uh, activated. So my vision was disconnected from my hearing for those five days, and my agency was effectively, for my right arm, disconnected from my body. So you are effectively outsourcing your senses and your intentions to people in other places. Now, I think it was important to, to just establish some context for your individual practice because the work that I really want to talk about and what's unique about both of you as artists is this unique collaboration on a project called Blender. So, <laughs> so for those who might not know the work, what is Blender? What is the design approach you took to creating this? Firstly, the, the object that yeah. is Blender. Yeah, uh, Blender is, a, is, a, is an installation, anthropomorphic in scale, uh, that consists of a spherical vessel and um, uh, 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 compressed air cylinders. Once every five minutes or whenever anyone got close enough to the installation, the compressed air would activate the blender blades, mixing the biomaterial from the two artists' bodies. So let's talk about that biomaterial. Like and Nina, I'm gonna turn, <laughs> gonna turn to you to explain, um, uh, you so wonderfully said, how the biomaterials were harvested oh, for harvest this oh my gosh. project. Okay, so have we made clear what the biomaterial actually was? I okay, don't think we so. Have. We're talking for, about fat from both of the artist's bodies. So um, harvesting involved having liposuction uh, with a, a medical practitioner who was good enough not to do too bad a job at getting it, but lean enough with his uh, approach that he would let us walk out with it as well. So um. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's a really interesting it's, point yeah. because uh, uh, it's considered biohazardous. If it's inside your body, it's fine when you extract biomaterial of any sort or an organ or whatever, it's considered biohazardous. We were getting phone calls from the infectious diseases unit from a hospital saying, no, you can't do this. We can't give you your biomaterial. So you had a very specific problem when trying to uh, get that biomaterial from your body and, it's, and it was a tricky word that you were using that you realized was probably a good thing not to use, which is the word art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't ever say art when you, because I often work with plastic surgeons and people when I, uh, you know, there's other projects that I work on using uh, biomaterials. If you say art, um, especially in Australia, I don't know if the context is any different here with ethical laws, 
People don't want to be involved, obviously, with things that might be up for sale. It's illegal to be selling sort of any sort of body parts or body organs. So research is a word you want. I, I just recently had a conversation where I accidentally said the word art and I had the same you know, response that was negative from a plastic surgeon. And I was desperately trying to backtrack and say, but you haven't seen my art practice. It never sells. It's not that kind of art. <laughs> <laughs> so. And the biomaterial uh, uh, to, to explain was... Uh, uh, extracted from my torso and Nina's uh, limbs. So this was really a machine installation which becomes the host for a liquid body composed of biomaterial from the two artists' bodies. Now, the fact that it's biomaterial causes very specific challenges for exhibiting uh, that work and what difficulty does come with exhibiting things like biomaterials in a in a gallery context? Well I think the interesting comparison is as well that this was originally shown in 2005 and it was shown more um, almost uh, working not undercover but just trying to get it into a space to be shown we didn't advertise it a lot but the recent showing of it was in the MCA which is a very um, prestigious gallery in Australia so it's a museum of contemporary art um, and of course, you've got to follow all the ethics approval. I was the only one that had the qualifications to be handling it. So every time it had to be, had to be taken um, out of the vessels, I had to be working with it. And we had to follow all the normal protocols that you would have in a lab. But the interesting thing was um, the MCA, you know, they saw it as artwork, but their insurance company did not. So SAT could not pass the, uh, the, their sort of standards of what could be considered an art material. So they only insured the vessels. Well, there were, different, uh, there were different forms of institutions that were making decisions on whether this was, was art or not. And I know it wasn't just a negotiation with the arts institution, but I know that insurance companies looked at it differently, but also the tax man <laughs> looked at this work very Yeah, no, actually, um, uh, used Blender as a, you know, as a way of getting a tax break on my salary that year. I mean, we, we, we paid for the surgical procedures to be done. We couldn't get them funded by the Arts Council and we uh, couldn't get it done free by the uh, uh, medical practitioner. So we had to pay for these. And uh, yeah, I sort of claimed it on my taxes the following year. And uh, the tax accountant good, did a good job in, in, in convincing uh, you know, the Australian tax office to um, subtract that from my earnings that year. So, so both subtracted from your body and subtracted from your, <laughs> from your earnings that year. But it's interesting with regards to that biomaterial versus the machinery of this artwork. I know that between the, the showing in 2005 and the recent showing, the only thing that's remained the same is the biomaterials and yet the machinery has changed. Could you explain the reasons why that's so important? Oh, look, it, it's just that the first time we showed Blender, um, the, the, the installation, the mechanics of it and all that, it was pretty done, uh, much done ad hoc. Uh, we had very limited funds to do this. We, we, we did it all on our own funding. Um, so there was, there, were, there was wiring everywhere. We couldn't have easy access to the different circuitries and components, pneumatic components that made up the machinery. So it was very difficult to, to do any repairs. And so when, when we were invited to show it at the MCA, we realized that, hey, we're really gonna have to re-engineer the, the installation. We kept the same aesthetics, uh, acrylic, stainless steel, uh, 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 the, the rubber mat on the floor. So we kept the same aesthetics and the same general appearance, but the actual internals had to be uh, updated really, and also made more reliable because um, the MCA, it was, it, was, it was what, three months yeah. on exhibition, whereas uh, the first time it was shown, it was only shown for less than a month. And, and it was shown pretty much uh, without any public awareness of what was going on. We decided not to do any radio or TV interviews until the very last days of the exhibition because we didn't want some, uh, you know, city health official shutting down the, the installation because of the supposed, you know, uh, risk in, in, in health and, and, and because of the hazardous biomaterial exhibited. So. 
Well, well, back to the, the, the boundary conditions for how art is viewed by different institutions. I know the insurance company would, would insure the housing, but wouldn't insure the bio materials. They didn't see that as piece of the artwork, and yet that is the piece that remains consistent throughout the different showings. I mean, how do you navigate that, Nina? How do you try and, not convince, but how do you try and... We did do a very good job at not convincing them. I mean, we were holding up examples like Mark Quinn's work and, you know, people <laughs> trying to use other body materials or, you know, um, so obviously in the end that we didn't, but I think it's, it's kind of interesting. I guess for them, it was a very expensive part to replace. I mean, we wouldn't have agreed to have surgery again, but I guess if you're going to cost the value, it would have been twenty thousand um, dollars replacement costs if if somebody had unfortunately knocked over our artwork. So. Now, how did the collaboration come together? Because I think we're here at London Design Festival. We really want to have discussions, especially the V&A, and this weekend about process and. How did you two come together and then decide, you know what would be a lovely weekend, a, a, a great day out would be, let's go get LiPo together? Do you want me to? Uh, well, well, I actually first, um, sorry, I actually first met Nina uh, uh, and saw her with a human arm. Um, so not long after that picture. So I had the leg one day, but I had the arm the other day who was coming down to visit. <laughs> um, so there was this sort of, you know, I guess, initial uh, connection uh, with our interest in, in anatomy. Um, and then the way this project came about was that uh, we were invited to participate in Technikunst, uh, a media arts festival in Melbourne, but we really didn't have time to do individual works for that festival. And so we thought, well, it'd be easier and quicker to do a collaborative work. Uh, but in fact, it turned out to be a very difficult project to realise uh, and physically uh, um, uh, taxing as well because, you know, don't believe that uh, having like a liposuction is an easy process. You know, uh, it takes six to eight months to recover feeling from peripheral nerve endings. Um, so it was a very uncomfortable and difficult pr procedure to go through. Um, so this wasn't going to happen again. Um, so we've actually kept the biomaterial in our deep freeze for the last uh, 11 years. <laughs> um, I really need a maniacal laugh to go with what I say as well. <laughs> well, it almost never made it to deep freeze, did it? Because I know... <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> uh, Nina can tell that. <laughs> okay, so with, with the treatment of the material, it had to be autoclave, so that's just a sterilisation process using heat. So with good friends that won't be named or universities that won't be named, we were able to access an autoclave to treat the material. But, um, and I'll say as well, we only had the surgery two weeks prior to the installation, so we were walking like little um, tin men as well, doing all of this, running around. But we went to pick up the material from the university and parked our car, unfortunately, in a clearway zone that was about to be cleared five minutes after we entered the building. So we walked out carrying a big bucket containing the fat that had been sterilised. A glass, a glass jar, not yeah. a bucket. <laughs> no, no, well, the, the glass <laughs> jar was inside the bucket. I, it's, it's, you know, but our car had been towed away on a Friday afternoon just before the car yards had it was about to shut. So we were left wandering around in agony with, with our fat, carrying it around, trying to get our car back. And we lived 80 kilometres out of town, so we needed to find it fast. So I think about four or $500 later, we were able to get our car and, and go home with the material. Yeah, and the biomaterial uh, originally, now it's been finely blended over and over again, uh, but initially it was quite chunky <laughs> and uh, also in very distinct uh, colourful layers. Uh, so we were walking around with this jar without a car uh, and then jumping into a taxi to try to get to this uh, place that had towed away and our if car. If you ever think you have moments that you start to doubt your art career, it's like this. <laughs> <laughs> and doubt your collaborations and collaborators. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> so, well, I, I want to talk about uh, fat just a little bit more because I know, Nina, you have a, a direct, I don't want to say obsession with fat, but you obsess over fat, not in the way that most people obsess over fat. You have an interest in fat because since 1997, it's now been considered an organ. We're, we're rethinking through what this material is. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, if you're going to describe sort of the day-to-day -day activity of a body dissector, you basically spend your day thoughtfully and carefully removing the fat from a cadaver. But if you look at the history of anatomy in the archives, like the anatomical sort of illustrated atlases, uh, fat's been sort of subject to systematic erasure. So you don't really see fat um, recorded, which is rather unfortunate when you think that anatomy is a science based on visual observation. So not to make it into the archives sort of um, is very detrimental to that sort of matter. So my interest in fat is also that it's appearing as a paradox at the moment. So it's not been in the history. It got reclassified as an organ. So it went from being what we can guess was a non-organ to being an organ. And I also work with stem cell researchers now, and the interesting thing there is that fat can now be used to get pluripotent stem cells, so it's very easy to harvest. And then you can get stem cells that you can differentiate into all the other tissues. So this beautiful conceptual shift that's happened from going to being a non-organ to being an organ, to being an organ that's got the capacity to make all other organs, <laughs> or at least the tissues of all other organs, yet it doesn't appear in our archives. So a lot of my artwork is about how to write fat back into the history of anatomy and exploring what it means to not be in that history. And for you, Stanlock, it was, it was to a degree about the, the biomaterials, but about the machinery. You, you describe Blender as an inverse of one of your previous projects, the stomach sculpture. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is sort of looking at the works in retrospect. We didn't uh, do Blender, you know, thinking of the stomach sculpture. But, but whereas Blender is, is a machine installation, which is the host for a liquid body, um, there was a previous project um, titled uh, Stomach Sculpture, where uh, I designed a sculpture for the inside of my body, for the inside of my stomach. Uh, so in this case, uh, here you had a, a soft organ, which was the host uh, for a machine choreography because the sculpture, once it was inserted inside the inflated stomach, opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound. <laughs> um, so, so Blender can be seen as the kind of inverse of, of the stomach sculpture. But again, this is looking at, at the projects in retrospect. You know, uh, there, there wasn't a kind of a, a linear kind of uh, development. I mean, uh, both of our interests are oscillating between actual and, and, and virtual, between uh, imaging and, and bodily performance uh, and so on. You know. and, and that oscillation is an oscillation between both art and science. And I want to talk a little bit about that collision and the challenge with that uh, collision or the cooperation between those two things. You've, you've tried very hard to stay away from biomedical aesthetics in your work because you don't want it to be about the aestheticization of science. Is that right, Nina? Um, I think it was more of an observation with, with Blender that it didn't incorporate what normally comes with the aesthetics of, of working um, with biomaterials, normally the glassware and everything that comes from working with labs. And that was, yeah, it was an interesting observation for us. With the art science, I always, even though it might look like I work in the sciences, uh, you know, working sometimes as a technician, I firmly see myself as an artist and the approach that I take is always as an artist, not as a scientist. So. And likewise, Stanlock, your approach is always as artist first, it just so happens that science and technology is part of your practice, is that right? Yeah, I think the best way to characterise the relationship between art and science is to consider the technologies um, as the interface between the two. I mean, the, uh, you know, artists might use technological apparatuses, instruments, uh, computational systems, but they use them in very different ways than, than scientists might use them. Artists are often fas fascinated by scientific phenomena because new technologies generate unexpected images, unexpected uh, uh, possibilities. You know, we, we now experience the world on the one hand uh, on the nano scale and on the other in, in the totally abstract and, and remote realms of, of data that we can't uh, subjectively perceive. Um, so uh, that's really the only relationship between art and science. Uh, the approaches are very different. Uh, very different methodologies, 
Um, you know, we like to, I think artists like to mess with, the, with scientific technologies. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, you know, whereas science deals with more reductive and, and disciplined um, uh, investigation into a phenomena, um, which needs to be provable, pr uh, uh, predictive sorts of data, uh, where, which others can use in a utilitarian and theoretical sense. This is not what art does. Uh, artists are better doing uh, or generating contestable possibilities, contestable futures, uh, possibilities that can be actualized, um, personally experienced, and thereby you might be able to interrogate and articulate uh, ideas that come from them. So, you know, being simplistic, science answers questions, uh, art generates more questions, but that's a very simplistic, you know, way of characterizing them. But if you want to make those sorts of distinctions. Well, I think it's just important to understand for our audience really about where this interest was sparked. And part of that is the theoretical interest in something called the post-human. Could you explain what the post-human is? <laughs> I think each individual who uses that term has to define it, how they're using and I know it. So you it's both not very <laughs> different <laughs> definitions. So, we do. so start we, with we you, do. Nina. Okay, so I'm more interested in critical post-humanist theory. So I'm, I'm looking more at um, anatomy, which is more of a classical science, and going back and looking at some of the possible assumptions or omissions that happen in, in that sort of science and that approach. And really, it's like with fat, it's an amplification of those missing elements and exploring then what that actually means to the, to the way that we perceive certain things. Like, I think I always talk about... I mean, I'm obviously very fond of fat, but fat is like the post-critical organ or the critical organ of post-humanism. It exceeds anatomy. It challenges anatomy. Even the fact that because I work... I mean, the way that I follow fat is I go around, I work maybe with stem cell researchers, I work in a body dissection lab, I work with my own, I'm tissue culturing fat at the moment. And fat is appearing as a paradox. Um, so I can work in an anatomy lab and it gets called obscuring matter and it gets thrown out. It gets treated as biohazardous waste. Um, and I think the, the questions that that sort of generates, that's my take on post-humanism, which is not quite what people would maybe expect as, you know, with body extensions and that. But I'm, I'm sort of looking at, if you're going to talk about redesigning the body, look at how classical and, and some of the sort of humanist ideas that you're maybe like a, a transhumanist might be pushing forward without knowing um, that they're doing so. Now, Stella, you don't just see post-humanism as theory, but you see it as practice. Oh, I... I, I... I mean, of course, I, my third hand project uh, were, were began in 1976. Um, so in a way, these projects and performances begin before these categories have become disseminated and, and, and popularised. Um, so I'm not, I, I'm rather sceptical about simplistic notions of transhumanism. Uh, I'm not interested in sort of sci-fi speculation. Um, as an artist, you want to uh, uh, not only deal with ideas, uh, but, but somehow actualize those ideas and, and personally experience them, uh, perform, and, and then discover what alternate anatomies might, might mean. Um, so that's the sort of general approach that, that I would take. Um, so I don't, I'm not operating on a theoretical or a sort of dogmatic basis, but rather I think you have to be sort of open to possibilities. Uh, uh, the way a lot of these projects and performances are realised uh, are with what I call a posture of indifference. In other words, indifference as opposed to expectation. Uh, you do things without expectation, being open to, to what happens. You allow the performances to unfold in their own time with their own rhythm. You incorporate accidents if they, if they happen. Um, and you're interested in, 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 in generating results and outcomes that, that are somewhat ambivalent um, and incomplete. 
uh, none of what I've done um, are projects that, that have been completed technically uh, on the software side, on, 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 uh, e even conceptually. Uh, I mean, I've made a career out of being a failure. Nothing that I've done turns out the way that I, I would like it to or the way that I've imagined it. We, we have some more of your, your failures uh, here. Now, <laughs> now, could you explain this failure? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I almost lost an arm for an ear, so uh, there, there was a serious problem of infection at one point. But no, uh, I mean, this project, in fact, begins as a project uh, that goes back to 1996 um, and uh, was first imaged as an ear on the side of my head. Um, uh, subsequently, I found out that this was a, an anatomically unsafe to, uh, place to have an extra ear, two ears are fine. Having another ear uh, is a problem and it might cause uh, partial face paralysis. Uh, but uh, the arm, the forearm is a, is a good place to have an extra ear because the skin of the forearm is, um, is soft, it's, um, it's very flexible and it's very ear-like and it's actually a very sensitive part of your body. Uh, so it's a safe location. And in 2006, we found, uh, we got funding and, and found three plastic surgeons to participate in the project. Nina actually documented uh, the surgery. Um, and it's still only a, a relief of an ear. If you can see it clearly from that distance. But the idea is to still lift the helix, uh, grow a soft ear lobe using my adult stem cells um, and then it seems like, uh, likely to happen after, after a long delay of, of attempts, failed attempts, that next year, by the middle of next year, it might be electronically augmented. So the idea is not simply to replicate an ear on my arm, but to electronically augment it so uh, it's internet enabled. So if you're in London and I'm in Melbourne, wherever I am, wherever you are, you'll be able to log in and listen to what my ear is hearing. And also to, with the GPS uh, in the chip, be able to locate where my ear is, hopefully still attached to this arm on this body. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, approach that's going to be taken. Um, again, uh, the ear is a kind of a, a soft prosthesis compared to the third hand or the extended arm where you're using kind of metal and chip silicon, uh, silicon chip circuitry and acrylic plastics. Uh, here you're using your own cells, your own skin to actually engineer uh, a, an, an extra ear. I want to talk very quickly about the expectations of the certain sorts of aesthetics that you create. Stella, to a degree, you've become the poster boy for, for the cyborg and, and the work that you're doing, Nina, to, to actually visualize the body in, in a multitude of ways. I mean, does the, the public and the audience that you present these works to have certain expectations when they come to your, to your work? Um. I, I'm quite notorious for changing the way that my work looks. Um, I've got very traditional history and background to my practice, and I, I never leave any sort of method of approach behind. So I, um, this is why I don't have a private gallerist, because they can't predict what I'm going to make from year to year. But um, I use each medium as a way of questioning an idea. So the, the consistent element in my work is anatomy. And so each media has a history or a certain approach of seeing. And I almost use that as a way of exploring an idea. So my works do tend to actually look quite different. You probably, yeah, they, they have a different aesthetic, very different to sell. Yeah. On, on the other hand, there is, there is that sort of comparison as well that um, uh, I've never sort of specialised in, in any one particular medium. Uh, the body is the sort of the conceptual continuity uh, between all of these um, approaches, uh, but I'm using sometimes, uh, you know, robotic hardware, uh, sometimes requiring uh, software programming, uh, sometimes uh, using virtual systems, 
um, performing on the internet uh, remotely. Um, so uh, in that respect, we, we, we have similar approaches in that we're not specialising in, in one particular medium. I'll be a bit cheeky and say I actually make most of my own things. So. <laughs> 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 just to focus back on to being a maker but I, I really also think through the making process as well so it's quite important for me to learn all the skills and everything that go into it is that really cheeky I guess it's <laughs> well I think what what Nina's alluding to is that is Clean that she's no no she's much more interested in uh in actually uh in in a in a in in the traditional sort of mark making and object making uh, and she takes a lot of care and her, her method is, is a very thorough one. Uh, as a performance artist, uh, there's no way that I can, uh, uh, that I can engineer uh, all of the robotic stuff, uh, that I can do all the programming on my own, uh, that I can do my own surgical procedures. Um, it would be great to be able to do all that. Uh, but you have to know enough about uh, these um, disciplines to be able to have appropriate expectations and to be able to uh, uh, make sure that uh, these projects can be realised in, in an adequate uh, period of time. And it's in the performance that you all of a sudden discover both uh, simultaneously the limitations and the, the possibilities of these interfaces. So I had no idea whether I could uh, five days, six hours a day continuously uh, be uh, disconnected from my vision, my hearing, and um, the, 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 the intentional uh, uh, capabilities of my arm, uh, just keeping my balance uh, and, and being able to sort of uh, uh, manage um, sometimes being on a, on, a, on a London bus, sometimes being on a bicycle riding through London streets, sometimes being at the Tate Modern, uh, but then at other times hearing a, a conversation in a, in a Chinese restaurant in New York where um, my friend Lauren's voice, because we were streaming in stereo, was in my left ear Nina's voice, uh, 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 Nina, another Nina in New York, her voice was in my right ear. And then there was another Chinese person in between uh, carrying on a conversation. And so your, your sort of awareness shifted from uh, either the visually intense moments to the acoustically engaging ones. Uh, but then as soon as your arm was jerked up by someone remotely, then you tended to lose your balance and you had to kind of, all of a sudden you were located proximally. Uh, in other words, you were blind to what, you, what was happening in the gallery. You, were, you couldn't hear what was happening in the gallery, but you could see remotely, you could hear remotely. I've actually got a funny story about the first day that Stoll was doing this performance. Um, me and some friends were watching online, so you could see him in the gallery on a plinth performing. And he wasn't aware of where he was or, you know, positioned on the plinth. <laughs> and so being good friends, we were actu act actuating him online and getting him to move. And we could see that he was moving closer and closer to the edge of the plinth. And we were about to ring the gallery and say, you know, get an interlocutor in there to push him back a little. And like, we really thought he was going to go over. Yeah, I, I totally lost my sense of, of, of positioning, really, and positioning orientation as well. Um, so... On subsequent days, I, I was more conscious of the fact that, you know, if my body was jerked around in one direction, uh, then I, I might sort of adjust in the opposite direction so that I, I would keep the same location because the plinth was, you know, uh, over 30 centimetres high. So falling off the plinth um, would have been a problem. <laughs> So we, uh, if we have an audience mic, um, as, as we was just checking, we, we have the possibility of an audience mic. We're going to open it up to audience questions um, shortly, if that's uh, possible. But before I do, the, the reason to bring both of you together on stage was less of a discussion about your individual practice, but this discussion about collaboration. You, you, you've done this very unique collaboration through Blender, but equally how you negotiate all the collaborations that you need to have to make your work possible. I mean, Nina, firstly, how do you negotiate that? 
that collaborative space between whether it's other people in the lab or the expectations other people have of your work or audiences? Um, I mean, I've got to, I also collaborate with my brothers. My brother's a quantum physicist and um, I, I don't make work about quantum physics. It's not that I go into his lab and elaborate on his ideas or anything, but um, at the collaborations, I still walk into the laboratories with an idea in mind. Um, so I think each negotiation is, is quite different. I have a slightly unique problem that, um, say for some of the projects I want to use, uh, want to do, the, like the recent one I'm working on, Fat Venus, where I have to get hold of an MRI machine, which I myself am not going to be able to do without a laboratory. To do that, I'm paying for the project and I'm also writing up all the human ethics approvals because it, uniquely I'm the subject and the researcher. So I have to say that I'm comfortable with being inside the machines. But to get access, I've got to have another person as the lead researcher, so the person who runs the lab. So I've got a number of projects at the moment, which it feels slightly strange for me, especially as a woman, that I don't have my name on. I have an older uh, gentleman as, as the lead researcher on my, on my work. So negotiating spaces between science and arts becomes, you know, each time it's a little different. It's different, again, with my brother. Um, I've got, you know sibling understanding <laughs> that, you know, I can, I can access things a little easier. And for you, Stella, is it a process of collaboration or sometimes a process of, of compromise? Oh, it's always, there's always compromise uh, and that's inevitable. I mean, it's not realistic if, you, if, if, if compromise doesn't happen. And also sometimes uh, if you're collaborating with uh, a software programmer or, or, a, bo or a robotics engineer, uh, you know, Sometimes uh, there's a, a method that you hadn't thought of yourself. There's an algorithm that, that you don't know of. Um, we used Markov chains, for example, with the Stickman uh, performance. Um, you know, so there's a contribution that inevitably will come from the other side. I think, I think um, as an artist, I've always initiated these projects. O on the other hand, um, there is the realisation and the respect for the other discipline that you're engaging with. Um, so uh, it's important to take into account, you know, any feedback from, from them. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, what you ask of the engineer or the programmer isn't plausible or possible. Um, and also the expectations with the ear. You can't do everything all at once. I mean, if you're doing cosmetic surgery, you've already got a nose. Yes, uh, the plastic surgeon can sort of scrape, scrape away some cartilage, uh, stitch up some skin uh, and, and produce a kind of a, a new nose, but you've already got a nose there already. When you're constructing something that isn't there to begin with, it involves a number of pr surgical procedures. Uh, uh, we did test the microphone inserted into the ear construct after the second surgery. Uh, so the surgeon was speaking to the ear, uh, even though the ear was wrapped in bandage, his voice was picked up and wirelessly transmitted. So it was plausible, this project was plausible, uh, but you know, we couldn't, leave the microphone in there and anyway there were wires sticking out of my arm and uh, but we'll be able to do this wirelessly we'll be able to charge the battery through the skin we'll be able to insert all the uh the the, the chip circuitry subdermally beneath the skin so uh you know that'll happen but yes uh, you you need to i think uh, respect the people that you're working with and be open to suggestions uh, that might improve on your own expectations. So on that note, do we have any audience questions? Wonderful, just here. And please wait for the, um, the microphone to come to you. Hi, thank you very much for an amazing introduction. Uh, just a question. The way you are positioning human body is obviously a baseline. This is kind of starting point. So through your pioneering efforts, can you envisage where is the target performance for you as an artist? Where would you see the maximum? If the body as we're born is zero, how far would you be prepared to go with augmentation and why? Uh, well, well, 
um, just to use a phrase of mine, the more and more pre performances I do, the less and less I think I have a mind of my own, nor any mind at all in the traditional metaphysical sense. So what you're looking at, what you're hearing, um, is this physiological, phenomenological, interacting, operating body in the world, uh, which is communicating with other bodies. What happens between us is more important than what happens inside of us. I mean, having an internal construction of a mind, a self or whatever, is a convenient way of speaking about uh, neuronal or physiological behavior. Um, so this is all there is. There is no distinction between a body and a mind. Um, the word I only is a word that conveniently enables me to speak about this body uh, in, in, a, in a simple way. Um, so um, I don't think there's a sort of any hierarchical level. I think there are alternate anatomical constructs that will enable the body to experience the world in different ways and perhaps adjust its awareness in doing so. Any other questions at all? Just behind you. I'm not sure you're going to show, but we just saw the picture for a second. He was hanging, I think, on the ceiling. So, yeah, I was just curious about it. Oh, I thought we'd forgotten question. about that if one. If he can give a brief story about it, it would be great. Yeah. Thank you. So I think the question is, could you just elaborate on the slide they thought they'd missed? Yeah. Oh. Oh, well, well, well this, um, ha having constructed this here on my arm, it led to some other performances and we, we made this uh, four meter long sculpture of, of the ear on my arm. And uh, I thought it would be an interesting idea to suspend the body uh, above the sculpture. So you had this uh, whole physical body with an ear on its arm suspended abon, uh, uh, above a much larger sculpture, uh, a much larger fragment of the body. Um, the body was uh, uh, spinning uh, the weight of the, uh, the body on the braided cable made the cable untwist, spinning the body around. Uh, this performance lasted for about 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a way of, in a sense, collapsing my initial concerns, exploring the physical limitations of the body um, and collapsing the, the ear on arm project um, in, in one and framing these together in, in one performative act. Uh, so I guess that's the way that I would, I would explain that, that performance. Um, yeah, thank you very much for a really, really interesting, sorry, I'm a bit <coughs> ill, so my voice sounds weird. Um, but I was really interested just to ask you a couple of questions uh, in terms of the physiological and then you brought it into the philosophical. Um, but the kind of arts um, and science and then the questions around body-to-body -body relationality and then also to do with technology as mediator. So it, it's, a, it's a practical kind of question in terms of what, what, what new, what, in terms of there being a new portal, a new vector, a new um, possibi set of possibilities, what, what do you think um, are the risks? And this has to do with sort of hacking and what does it mean when the technology plays such a, an increasingly important role in, term, in terms of the bodily and the, the kind of animal experience, if you will? Uh, I don't know if technology um, so much. Okay, uh, the question is generally about body hacking. No, it isn't actually, it's different again, sorry. It's about risks and uh, yeah. Well, let me give you the example. When you say that you could technologically Co connect your ear and your arm um, to something that becomes, you know, virtual and that people can tap into sort of thing. So um, what kind of risks does that expose you to in terms of your, well, it could be data related, it could be um, related to something about yourself that you're not necessarily happy with the world knowing, the surveillance side really. Yeah, I'm, t I'm terribly sorry because the acoustics are really bad and I, H half understood, but... Uh, so, so I think the question, Stalock, was, was around risk. Are, are you worried that audiences, when you give them certain degrees of agency over your body in these performance works, uh, do you worry about what they may 
do to you? You have one particular risk of losing all your friends once you get this internet <laughs> neighbor. <neighborhood. laughs> Who would want to casually hang out with you? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, more broadly, more broadly, uh, let me, let me. So, so more broadly, Stan, your, your approach, your, your approach to risk, you take this very pro-actionary approach to your own body, you, you use your body as your own laboratory. I mean, what is your personal approach to how you think about risk? Is there certain things where you go, okay, now I draw? Look, yeah, look, you don't, you don't do deliberately dangerous things. Um, uh, <laughs> A lot of these Everyone's got different thresholds. <laughs> a lot of these projects and performances, um, yes, they're either physically difficult, uh, physically uncomfortable, uh, technically complex. Uh, uh, they sometimes involve remote interaction. Uh, I mean, I did a series of performances where people in other places were able to access my body through a touchscreen interface and remotely choreograph the body's movements uh, using a via a muscle stimulation system. So 15 to 50 volts of electricity, uh, contract your muscles and you move, uh, it, you, you can't resist, uh, the, the voltage is too strong. But of course, um, you know, the, the, the interface doesn't allow someone to, to kind of bend your arm backwards, you know, to the point where you might hurt a joint or, you know, uh, so the system is designed uh, to, to kind of push the limits of your body, uh, but, but, but not to, to stupidly endanger it. Uh, um, and, and, you know, the, uh, the suspension performances, they were actually mostly done in remote places, uh, uh, remote locations, private galleries. There were only two major uh, uh, public performances with the suspensions, one uh, uh, over 11th Street in New York, uh, uh, where uh, I had a good view of the police cars that arrived in about five minutes. <laughs> and, and what began as, as a kind of a performance of 30 minutes was stopped after 12. And the, the body was arrested, not for display of public nudity, not for uh, some sadomasochistic act, but rather being a danger to the public. Had I fallen on someone, for example? Uh, so there was a risk to the audience in that, in that regard. And then in Copenhagen, um, 60 meters up using a very large crane. Um, but after 30 meters, all I could hear was the whooshing of the wind, the whirring of the crane motors, and the creaking of the skin. <laughs> there were no safety nets. There were no, you know, and the body was 60 meters high. But, you know, having done 26, 27 suspension events before, uh, I knew that uh, my skin would not kind of break and I knew the cables were strong enough. I'm sorry? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, again, uh, there is a you can't you can't uh, 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 erase all risk. Uh, you have to take some some risk in in these physical challenges. But uh, you know, it, it's not done in an un, in an unthinking way. You do plan ahead. Well, Nina, I know the. the piece of work we showed just here. I know you have a certain feeling and visceral response to things like that. So he may be fine, but I know, you know, how you have to navigate that. I was, I was at this performance and I, I survived it okay. I looked quite elegant on film. I was aware it was being filmed, but I actually cried for two days after this. It was quite harrowing to actually witness. And I, I can handle pain myself quite well. I've had a lot of surgery when I was a teenager and this is all fine, but I'm not very good at witnessing pain. So actually, Seeing the, the performance, I don't think, I think that was my first and last uh, suspension performance I'll go to. <laughs> and he was fine. You were absolutely fine. I mean, everyone, I think, in the room was quite bewildered that um, you seemed to be okay and all of us needed to some sort of, um, to meet over the following days just to make sure that you were okay. Yeah, no, no I, th I, think, uh, I think what Nina does point out, though, is that 
there is a difference between, uh, you know, the physical presence or being in the physical presence of a performance, whatever it is. There was another performance I did um, connected to an industrial robot arm. And, uh, you know, the kind of the power of that and that the power and the potential for catastrophe with that large industrial robot arm, you could only sense if you were there, you know. Um, and, and, you know, video has a good, uh, tends to flatten and, and, and kind of uh, sterilise, the, 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 you know, the physical experience. But, you know, as a, as a performance artist, you have to take the physical consequences for your ideas. If you think of a cute idea of having a, you know, a... a, a a sculpture inside your stomach, you've got to undergo a medical endoscope and, and uh, a probe into an inflated part of your body. Uh, if you have an idea of suspending your body, you've got to put up with 18 hooks into the skin. Um, if, you, if you think of, of having an extra ear, you under, have to undergo several surgeries and the discomfort and the possibility of infection that, that resulted. So. Um, it's one thing to have an idea. Ideas are, are easy. It's actualizing those ideas and, and experiencing the physical outcomes uh, that I think generate uh, the possibilities of, of further iterations, not iterations in the mathematical sense where you do something better and better, uh, but rather iterations in the sense that uh, this produces uh, unexpected and alternate possibilities. And that's a good way, I think, uh, uh, of thinking about uh, art production. We have time for just one more question. Gentlemen, just here. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. I just wondered, particularly for the artists in the room, if you could kindly talk further about how you went about approaching health professionals within your projects, particularly because um, the importance of the health professional following the agenda of the artists for many of the outcomes, and actually if there were any tensions which came from that dialogue and the narrative which that was like for both of you as the health professional and the artist. So, so the, the question was, how do you first approach potential collaborators? What is the negotiation that has to occur? Um, I mean, to some degree, it's just don't tell them it's art. But. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely research. And I guess, I mean, because I do often work in the context of an institution. Um, for me, it's a little bit more organic and... and um, yeah, I know, I just... it's. Ha the, the easiest way to facilitate a project, um, and I'm finding working within institutions, it slows down the process a little bit um, more, but yeah, I don't know, because I, I do a lot of the making. Um, I don't, it's not so much I make a conscious decision who I'm going to, to, to locate to do these things. That's not quite a complete answer, but it's, you know, it's, you're, you're much more of somebody that goes out and, and seeks um, particular yeah, I, I mean, I think what's important is is to try to personalise any collaboration. Um, and, and for example, most of my projects have occurred because, you know, you, you've become friends with someone uh, who happens to be an endoscopist. Uh, or when I was living in Japan, um, I used to correct the English of a robotics engineer uh, who was publishing his papers. Uh, and I learned a lot about robotics, but became good friends with uh, uh, Shigeo Hirose at the time. And that, that enabled me to meet other robotics engineers and to, to consult them about, for example, the, the, uh, ear, um, the third hand project. Uh, and, and without that process, it would never have happened. I think the best collaborations ha uh, occur when they're not at an impersonal level, that they're not at a business level. Um, the uh, getting access to the large industrial robot arm with all its perceived safety issues uh, was the result of um, uh, 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 coming across a company whose director was the alumni, one of the alumni from Curtin University where I, I now have a position. So, 
that got me in the front door and I, and I was able to, to sort of at least uh, uh, have the chance to explain what I wanted to do. But it was a real roller coaster ride. I mean, one week he was willing to do it, the next week he wasn't so sure uh, because, you know, in the end he felt he was responsible that if there was a software glitch, if there was a power failure while the performance was going on, this robot might behave unpredictably and might cause uh, you know, perhaps a fatality. So he wasn't really keen on, on the project, but because we became friends, because he was a, an alumni from Curtin, uh, that's the way that project happened. So in a way, a lot of these things are opportunistic and, and uh, very personalized. And that's the best way of doing it because people help you because they may be interested in what you're doing. I think I just on reflection and listening to Stella as well, I think if, you, if you're going to talk about the real practical um, side to it, I think sincerity in approaching people that you may need to work on a project with you, um, learning a little bit of a shared language, but also it can be disastrous if, if a collaboration has been set up artificially by outside organisations, that it'd be great for an artist to come in, you get selected, you get put into a lab, um, and there's often a hidden directive in there that you'll be somehow promoting what's happening in that lab, and that narrows all the possibilities down from the very beginning, and also sets up an idea and agenda in, the, in your collaborator's head of what's going to take place. So I tend to find it's better, I mean I think it's very, I've always worked as a little bit of an outsider and I think that's worked to my benefit that I've already been somewhere working as a technician, listening to conversations, participating in things, formulating my ideas and then you can see people who you'd like to work with. But I don't know even now that I've been working in the arts and sciences for a, a, a fairly long time and, and I don't sort of classify myself as that but that's, that's where I sort of situate, am situated. Um, I don't think I would do so well if I was just married up with a scientist and told to go away and make something in three months' time. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. And uh, I, I was once invited to participate in a program titled Artists in Labs. Uh, it was, it was uh, out of Zurich. No, it was a very good pro program. It was a very good program for most of the artists who participated. But I, I, I said I would participate. Um, if the artists, uh, if uh, we could not only experiment in the lab, but they could do experiments on the artist. Uh, and that was really not agreeable, so I, I didn't participate. Uh, but, you know, we know, for example, with medical practitioners, that uh, it's, it's a very conservative community. Uh, that, but we also know that medical practitioners do experiments on the aged, the injured, and the ill. Which category are you trying to fill? But not on consenting <laughs> artists. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> it only took an hour. <laughs> just to the end. Luke had a meeting with us last, year, last week and he was just like, oh my God, it's going to be like a domestic. Oh, I was trying to avoid. So before, before we do start, start a domestic on stage, I... Uh, <laughs> I want to first thank the uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum for hosting this this afternoon, and and I, and I want to end this discussion how we end every single virtual futures discussions, which is with a slight warning, and it's this: the the future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. Although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that today. Have an amazing day at the Victoria and Albert Museum and please join me in thanking the incredible Stella and Nina Sellers.